So this is a presentation on the RAPD, the Relative Afferent Pupillary Defect. This is a concept that I really struggle with during my medical school education, and I hope that this presentation will make it easier for the viewer to grasp this uh, difficult topic. So in some ways, an RAPD can be thought of as a bit of a paradox, where uh, we can define it as a situation where you shine a light into an eye, and the pupil dilates. So we obviously understand that when you shine a light into an eye, you expect the pupil to constrict. Um, and yet we have the opposite happening here. And when we see this, this is a bit of an ominous sign that the transmission of the optic nerve of that eye is faulty, suggesting that there's an optic neuropathy. So I'm gonna show you an example now of an RAPD and we'll go through the video um, and provide an explanation of how the mechanism works and we'll come back and look at the uh, video afterwards and hopefully have a better understanding for what's going on. So here is a uh, very poor quality cartoon that I made of a person. Um, this is the right eye, this is the left eye, this is their nose, uh, which is far too triangular and simplistic, I apologize. Um, but let's uh, allow ourselves to accept the fact that this is a person and we'll watch what happens during the video demonstration. So. The person's in, this is the light around the person, it's an intermediate level of light. And we now can appreciate that as it, the light changes, the pupil diameter changes is something we probably are all comfortable with. In very bright light, the pupils will be very constricted. In very dark light, the pupils are very dilated. And of course, somewhere in the middle, in the uh, gray, uh, background. And what we're going to do is just imagine that we can assign values to the amount of light. So in the dark, there's minimal light. We give that a value of one. In very bright light, we would say that that's a five. And then here it's somewhere in the middle. We'll call that a two. These are just arbitrary units, of course, that I'm making up. So what would happen in this situation? where the person, um, their right eye is completely in the dark and their left eye is in very bright light. What will we expect the pupil's sizes to be in each eye? So the mistake that um, could be made is to assume that the following would occur, that because the right eye is in the dark, the pupil there will be very large and because the left eye is in the bright light, the pupil will be very small. And of course, this is incorrect. And the idea is that the brain, when it's determining what the pupil size should be, looks at the total amount of light coming from both eyes. The pupils in this case are constricted to this extent, this small extent, because the total is a 10. And they are constricted dilated to this extent because the total is a two, a much smaller number. So that in this case here, where there's intermediate light, that the sum is a four, the pupils have this diameter. And in this case here, it doesn't matter that this pupil is in complete darkness because this pupil is in a more intense light of a value of four, the total is four, and so the amount of stimulation that the brain receives from both eyes is the same in the top part as it is in the bottom part. And so the pupil diameter in each will be the same. Somewhere down deep inside to some of us, this might seem very unfair. <laughs> we might jokingly say, why should this pupil be treated the same as this pupil when this pupil is providing all the lights to the brain? 
and his pupils providing nothing, why should the brain treat them in the same way? But that's the reality. The brain, at the end of the day, does not care which eye the light's coming from. It just looks at the total sum of light that it's receiving and treats the pupils the same way, regardless of which pupil contributed the drive. So here's another very simplistic diagram where, again, we have our right eye and our left eye. We have over here the sensor in the brain where the overall stimulation from both eyes arrives to and is summed. This area would be at the, uh, the top layer of the midbrain, an area that we call the pretectum. And so the drive comes from each optic nerve to the pretectal area. And then the, this area stimulates pupil constriction via parasympathetic nerves, or via parasympathetic fibers in each in the third nerve itself, via a specific nucleus in the um, third nerve called the Edinger Westfall nucleus. But again, uh, the main idea is that from each eye, light travels, or stimulates the midbrain through the optic nerve, which in turn drives the amounts of pupil uh, tone. Um, according to the amounts of light that it receives, the more light that is um, stimulated here, the more drive will be to each pupil, the increased parasympathetic tone, and the more constricted the pupil will be. So let's go through an example. Let's say that, again, we know, as we said before, the person's in intermediate light, and the two refers to the amount of drive or stimulation in the optic nerve from the light um, surrounding the eye. And the sum in the brain is four, and therefore the pupils are driven accordingly. So now we've turned the light off in the room. And we're going to see what happens when we shine the light to each eye. So we go ahead and shine a light into the left eye. And the pupils, of course, constrict. And they constrict to a certain amount that's based on the overall stimulation the brain is receiving, which is a 5 coming exclusively from the left eye. Now the light is brought over to the right pupil. And the pupil size doesn't change at all because the amount of overall stimulation that the brain is receiving is still a 5. Now let's think about what happens in this scenario if we have an impaired optic nerve, in this case on the left side, which is not going to fully transmit the stimulation that the retina in that eye is receiving. So again, we go from the dark and the light is shone into the eye. And in this case, whereas normally this level of light is a 5, the amount of actual stimulation that the brain receives is only a 2 because the nerve is not transmitting all the lights. Because it went from a 0 to a 2, however, the pupils did constrict. Now the light is brought over to the right eye, and in this case, um, the drive is full, uh, a 5. And so the pupils have constricted even further. Now we're going to bring the light back over to the left eye. And here, I hope you can now understand, we will now have our paradox. That because when the light is brought over to this eye, the amount of stimulation that the brain receives has dropped from a 5 to a 2, the pupils have dilated. And this was our paradox. That we went from a situation of um, optic nerve that was unimpaired to bring the light to the side where it is impaired, and because of that, the pupils dilate. And this is what we're looking for when we see an RAPD. And I should point out that this would be the case where there is a very marked impairment of the optic nerve, where the, the pupil actually dilates. In the real world, what we sometimes see is that 
the pupillary constriction consistently on that side is not as impressive, that it doesn't react um, as much so that the pupil constriction is not, doesn't extend as fully, the pupil doesn't become quite as constricted, or it becomes constricted but seems to release itself and dilate again relatively quickly. It's the sort of thing we have to go back and forth between the eyes, and we might see examples of this at some point. And when you think that the pupillary constriction looks consistently less impressive on one side, then you would say I have a relative difference, and the side in which the, it was consistently weaker or less impressive would be the side that you would um, surmise has an RAPD. We're going to go back now to our video and see um, how hopefully everything makes sense now. As the video starts and the, pupil, the light is shining just right into the left eye, you'll see that the left eye, which has is the side where there's an RAPD, will constrict initially because we're going from darkness to light. But that once we're coming from the right eye back to the left eye, we'll see that the left eye will dilate. Let's watch that now and watch it again after two. So there it constricts. But when we come back now, it dilates. The right eye constricts, and the left eye dilates. The right eye constricts, and the left eye dilates. So hopefully we now have a clear understanding of what we mean by a relative afferent pupillary defect. When we break down the name, the last part should be easy. It's a pupillary defect. It's important to remember that it's an afferent issue versus an efferent issue with an E. The reason that the pupil is reacting defectively is based on the afferent input of light to the brain. The problem is not with the abilities of the third nerve parasympathetic fibers to control the pupillary diameter. They're behaving appropriately. It's the drive that's coming through the optic nerve that's the issue, the afferent signal. And it's a relative afferent pupillary defect, meaning that if we were just checking the defective eye alone, we might think that it's normal, because after all, when we shine light into it, from the dark at least, it does constrict. It's only when we're comparing it relative to the other eye that we see that there is a deficiency in terms of the pupillary reactivity, again, making it a relative problem. I just want to take a second before we finish this section of the talk to speak about the terms direct and consensual response. We've already covered these ideas in the talk that I just gave, um, and just to point out how. So, the, coming back to this diagram, we called that when we shine the light into the uh, patient's left eye, that we had a constriction of both eyes. What happened in the left eye, we would call the direct response. The light itself was shone into the left eye, and fact that the left eye constricted was a direct response to the presence of the light. What happened in the right eye is called the consensual response. The right eye did not constrict because light was shone into it. It constricted as a response to the fact that light was shone into the left eye through the pathways that we now explained. There was a consensual response in the right eye. When we're checking the pupils beyond looking for an RAPD, it's important to look for a direct response. Looking for the direct response has implications in terms of identifying phenomena called a light near dissociation, which might be the topic of another talk. Particularly important in terms of identifying a particularly dangerous uh, entity called a dorsal midbrain syndrome. Looking at the consensual response, while it's commonly taught in medical classes, and sometimes I see that 
uh, examiners might expect the student to look for it has much less clinical significance. We know that it's a physiological phenomenon that consensual response does occur. Um, it does have value in certain situations that, again, are more advanced topics, such as how to check pupils in the case of uh, someone who has a pupil-involved uh, third nerve palsy. Okay, that's the end of this talk.